Item number, SCP-150. Object class, Keter. Special containment procedures. SCP-150 patients kept for study should be contained in level 3 biohazard containment cells, with no more than one instance per cell. Cultures of SCP-150 are contained in vacuum-sealed glass flasks in the Site-42 Infectious Materials Lab. Standard pathogen handling procedures should be followed at all times. Any instances of SCP-150 found outside of containment are to be incinerated. Description SCP-150 is an obligate parasite that resembles the tongue-eating louse, Zymothoa exigua, but is adapted to form conjunctive symbiotic relationships with humans for a period of its lifespan. Upon contact with a human subject, SCP-150 embeds itself deeply in the flesh of its host. Over the course of approximately seven days, the parasite will burrow into the host and affect numerous physiological alterations. The most glaring alteration is the gradual conversion of the limb nearest the infection site into a chitinous appendage. As SCP-150 consumes the host's flesh, it excretes tissue that replaces and augments the functionality of the host's limb without causing transplant rejection. It is suspected that SCP-150 is able to secrete anesthetic and immunosuppressant substances to prevent the host's body from responding to the change. Furthermore, the nervous tissue excreted by SCP-150 is able to interface with the host's nervous system. By the time the process is complete, the host will be able to control the affected limb with no loss in mobility and often with improved strength, reflexes, and resilience. For a period of one to two weeks, SCP-150 will reproduce, feeding on nutrients from and depositing eggs into assimilated blood vessels. It is hypothesized that SCP-150 can self-fertilize. The eggs are deposited throughout the human body via the bloodstream, while the vast majority of them die off. Enough survive to begin colonizing and altering the rest of the host's body. Though subjects report discomfort and occasional loss of motor control during this process, they often will not recognize the cause of said discomfort. It is still unclear why the offspring do not compete with each other for space or resources, nor how the assimilation process leaves the body's cell signaling mechanisms and processes unaffected. SCP-150 reproduces during this assimilation process. As the lungs are assimilated, more eggs are produced and spread by the patient's coughing. Although as many as 10,000 eggs may be produced during this time, it is estimated that only 1% of them find their way into another host, of which 1% survive the host's immune response and implant successfully. Although SCP-150 inevitably results in the assimilation and alteration of the central nervous system, including the spinal cord and brain, the host's consciousness and behavior are seemingly unaffected. Interviews with subjects infected by SCP-150 have yielded little information, as infected subjects unaware of SCP-150 claim to sense no changes or improvement in certain senses and faculties. While subjects aware of the infection are able to pinpoint the source of the change, they exhibit little to no negative feelings and often express positivity towards it. Addendum 150E Transcript of Exploratory Leucotomy and Nervous Tissue Transformation Experiments Two D-Class Subjects, D-13732 and D-016002, were infected with SCP-150 and allowed to progress through all stages of the infection. In order to examine the full effect of the infection, exploratory neurosurgeries were performed on both subjects. D-13732 was euthanized. His nervous tissue was found to have been entirely replaced by smaller instances of SCP-150. The instances comprising his brain matter were extracted and stored for experimentation on D016002. The following decompressive craniotomy and leucotomy were performed by Dr. Harlan's son, Dr. Wendy Robin, and Dr. Alex Harlow on D016002. A full transcript follows. Begin log. 2143. D016002 is partially anesthetized to numb her during the initial drilling of the skull. The process is uneventful, though Harlow reports expecting less resistance from the skull while drilling into and cutting a flap from it. 
Upon removing the flap of bone and exposing the dura mater, numerous smaller instances of SCP-150 are observed lying in the cranial cavity, where the brain should be. Harlow reports this to Robin, who alerts Sun to begin the interview process while she marks off areas of D016002's brain on a mapping projection. Dr. Sun, what is your name? D016002. Mako. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002. Chair. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002. Green. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002 pauses for a moment. D016002. Two. Dr. Robin, we have marked off the approximate location of the Wernix area, the part of the brain that controls speech recognition and use. Dr. Harlow, thank you, doctor. Son, I will now extract some of the specimens from this area. Dr. Harlow carefully makes an incision into the dura mater and extracts some of the instances from the area using forceps. He places each instance into a glass vial, corks it, and places it on a nearby stand. Each instance appears to stir to life and begin wriggling only upon being removed. This process takes approximately 10 minutes, during which time Sun repeatedly asks D016002 the same questions. Once Harlow has extracted approximately 100 instances, he gestures for Sun to continue. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, uh, uh, seat. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, green? Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002, two. Dr. Sun, note for the record that D016002's responses have been slightly slowed. This indicates that the instances within her cranial cavity are indeed acting as neuron analogs though it is unclear as to how many neurons each instance is equivalent to. Dr. Harlow, I am placing a sample of neural tissue acquired from D13732 into D016002 now. The instances from D13732 have been tagged with a radioactive luminescent dye to distinguish them for extraction later. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, couch. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, blue. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? D016002, two. Dr. Sun, what is 10 times 11? D016002, 111. Dr. Sun, D016002's responses have returned to normal speed. This suggests that it is possible for 150 nervous tissue to be swapped freely between host individuals without rejection. We will now begin the final procedure. D016002, you will be given a full general anesthetic. D016002 is subjected to a general anesthetic, which takes several seconds to begin. Dr. Sun, the patient is now under full anesthesia. Dr. Harlow, you may begin the process of tissue extraction. For this final procedure, we will be attempting to completely replace the brain tissue of D016002 with that of D13732. Previously, during the exploration of D13732's cranial cavity, Dr. Harlow and I observed that the instances connecting his brain matter to his spinal matter were not secured in any way, and in fact seem to be switching positions with other instances in the brain. We will be seeing how far this compatibility extends. There is silence for the next hour, as doctors Harlow, Sun, and Robin remove the top of D016002's skull and begin extracting her brain matter into a large glass container. Dr. Sun, extraction complete. D016002's brain matter has been successfully removed. Dr. Harlow is now placing D13732's brain matter into D016002's exposed cranial cavity. Silence for several minutes. Dr. Robin, heart rate steady. We have a pulse and breathing. Give it another minute. All right, I'm going to wake her up. 
There is a pause as Dr. Robin reduces the anesthesia and D016002 awakens. Dr. Sun, what is your name? D016002, Michael. Dr. Harlow, faintly heard in background. Jesus. Dr. Sun, name something to sit in. D016002, beanbags. Dr. Sun, what is the color of grass? D016002, green. Dr. Sun, what is one plus one? Quiet sloshing can be detected by the microphone. Dr. Robin, hey, uh, son? D016002, two. Dr. Robin, son, look. D016002's brain is shown to move of its own accord, subtly moving back and forth. Dr. Harlow, well, that's new. Dr. Sun, do you feel any pain anywhere in your body? D016002, my chest is kind of heavy, feels just the same otherwise. Dr. Sun, good to hear. Now, what is... D016002, hey, I usually feel pretty energetic, even before surgeries, but I'm kind of tired right now. Lately, I've been exercising before I sleep, but since I can't sleep here... Is it okay if I can just rest a little bit? Dr. Sun, rest. D016002, like three, five minutes. I can do that here if it's okay. A small portion of the top of D016002's brain parts before making a gurgling sound. After the portion closes, sections of D016002's brain retracts into itself rapidly. D016002's eyes close. Dr. Sun, that doesn't seem good. Dr. Robin steps away from the operation, making retching sounds as she leaves the room. Dr. Harlow, D016, uh, D13732, are you okay? D016002, yeah, yawns. I'm fine, why do you ask? Item number. SCP-165 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Housed in a facility at Armed Biocontainment Area 14, SCP-165 is to be treated as a contagious pathological organism. The highest sterilization and quarantine procedures are to be followed. Microwave field generators around SCP-165's area are in place to restrict movement of its dune within its containment area. Once every nine days, SCP-165 is fed live cattle weighing at least 750 kilograms. Description The organic component of SCP-165 resembles that of typical parasitic mites, 750 micrometers in length, with eight legs and a genetic structure similar to the house dust mite. The main difference is the hermit crab-like behavior of attaching grains of sand to its back. It is unknown what purpose the sand serves, but the massive colony of SCP-165 numbers into hundreds of billions, to possibly trillions, creating a rather large dune. The similarities between data expunged and SCP-165 are only superficial. Data expunged's colony is protozoan in nature and apparently shows a collective intelligence and awareness that is not understood. SCP-165's colony is made up of individual Akari who don't show cooperation, but rather competition in the hunt for food. Like mosquitoes, they rely on chemical detection of carbon dioxide and sugars in the air to detect prey. The Akari mites roll and bound over one another toward prey, only using their legs to climb over one another. When in contact with the flesh of animals, they release a numbing chemical toxin in their bite, similar in makeup to that of mosquito and flea bite toxins. Subjects are typically unaware that millions of mites are taking turns at grabbing mouthfuls of its flesh as they swarm around their victim. A typical swarm resembles a swirling vortex around a victim or victim's appendage. The SCP-165 colony is efficient enough in their competitive swarming that most animals' appendages can be defleshed and reduced to bone within minutes. The numbing toxin is so effective 
that sleeping victims may not wake up as their limbs are being eaten away. The Akari mites are resistant to all but the most dangerous of pesticides. They retreat from heat and will often seek shade when available, being the most active during the night, hunting for large sleeping prey. Their vulnerability to heat is the most preferable technique for containment. Addendum Acquisition It is apparent that the US government has been aware of dunes of SCP-165 for some 80 years. The area where SCP-165 was found is a now forgotten German immigrant ghost town of Fredericksburg, Arizona, in the Toole Desert, near the Goldwater Air Force bombing range. The remote town of Fredericksburg was founded sometime in the late 1800s, and by 1908, had become a ghost town. A passing cavalry troop reported that the inhabitants had disappeared, and that the buildings were empty. They attempted to stay one night in the abandoned hotel, only to have seven of their horses reduced to piles of bone. All but four of the soldiers fled in the middle of the night, saying that sand was filling the building like a flood of water. Those four were never seen again. During the late 1950s, the US military attempted to exterminate SCP-165 by turning the area into a bombing range. It was successful in reducing the numbers of SCP-165, but in the late 1980s, it became apparent that a ground cleanup and extraction was needed to remove the presence of SCP-165. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-9, aka Fire Eaters, were dispatched for containment and extraction of SCP-165. Upon entering the town of Fredericksburg, an upturned sign was found, reading, Beware the Creeping Hungry Sands. The flame accelerators of MTF Epsilon-9 proved highly successful in glassing the sand of SCP-165 and reducing its number to a manageable size. A living dune of nearly four metric tons of SCP-165 was contained and transported to ABC Area 14, where it is monitored and contained. Item Number SCP-171 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures a 4,500-liter pool of seawater located at Bioresearch Area 12 is the current research location of SCP-171. Though not immediately dangerous, minimal physical contact between secretions of SCP-171 and its hosts are to be observed. All communications between hosts and researchers are to be recorded and transcribed. Human hosts are to be fed a vegan diet of their choosing. Other animal hosts are to be fed appropriately. Fresh seawater is to be cycled into its tank regularly. Description Originally, SCP-171 was thought to be a colony of microscopic organisms, similar to SCP-968 or SCP-165, but further investigations revealed SCP-171 to be a single entity, spanning 300 square meters when first encountered. SCP-171 is a web-like matrix of small, fine tendrils of neurons, mucous glands, and muscle fibers, suspended in a frothy foam of its own creation. It is not capable of self-locomotion and does not actively attack or feed on other living organisms. Rather, it attempts to form a symbiotic relationship with all organisms it comes into contact with. Flagella of the muscle surrounding the neural fibers work mucus, sea salt, water, and other secretions into bubbles, forming a large foam support. Any creature that spends a significant amount of time in contact with the matrix of SCP-171 risks becoming integrated into a collective consciousness sustained by it. People who become covered in SCP-171 foam describe a tingly or tickly sensation experienced which researchers have observed as threads of SCP-171 tunneling through the skin to directly integrate into the subject's nervous system. In time, the simple motor neurons of subjects are expanded into an elaborate two-way positive communication nexus, allowing the brains of hosts to communicate with each other and the entity of SCP-171. Over time, the individuality of subjects are incorporated into and shared with others of the SCP-171 matrix, resulting in a collective consciousness in which individual personalities are non-existent. 
There are currently 19 human subjects host to SCP-171, 11 civilian, and 8 Class D personnel. Subjects are capable of traversing the foam without losing conscious contact with the collective, as neuroreceptors on the subject's skin form to allow chemical communication between the subject and SCP-171, much in the same way terminal axons communicate with dendrites in the brain. These receptors on the skin look like small white to clear moles, slightly raised and very sensitive to touch. Some subjects disappear into the foam of SCP-171 and are not seen again for several months. It is unknown how they survive without fresh water or sustenance. Other hosts include two Australian porpoises, originally four, four beach gulls, three have been euthanized, 41 fish of various species, euthanized for study, 27 beach crabs, euthanized for study, and one canine. Within two hours, most subjects begin forming neuroreceptors on the skin and receiving neural contact with SCP-171. After three hours, a psychological bond has been established between subjects and the collective. After six hours, a complete integration and dependency on the collective has evolved. At this point, removing the subject from contact with SCP-171 results in manic and violent behavior, along with eventual complete psychological breakdown of the individual, leading to a vegetative state of mind. Four individuals have been lost in this manner. When interviewed, all subject hosts speak with the same core collective consciousness as if they were parts of a single entity. The collective is aware of itself and its composure of diverse individuals, and even laments the loss of each individual persona. SCP-171 tells researchers that it understands what it is, but not where it came from, explaining that its own intelligence and the intelligence of the hosts it incorporated were too simple to understand or remember its origin. Researchers noted the change in SCP-171's personality after integrating Class D personnel and chose not to allow inclusion of violent, ill-willed, or malevolent personnel from that point on. SCP-171 has expressed that through meditation and understanding, it chooses to avoid the consumption of other animals when possible. Addendum 171-1 SCP-171 was first encountered by beachgoers and surfers on August 12, 2007, along the Australian coastline near Yamba, New South Wales, when civilians playing in the foam began experiencing abnormal skin conditions. CDC officials contacted SCP personnel when they were unable to explain the anomaly. Addendum 171-2 Personnel who wish to be voluntarily integrated with SCP-171 must first be subject to a complete psychological evaluation to ensure sound mental health, with special emphasis on possible disconnection from humanity and potential suicidal tendencies. They are to be repeatedly warned that such integration is permanent and that no evidence exists to show that SCP-171 in any way exhibits a state of higher consciousness or indeed a consciousness significantly different from our own. If subject persists in wishing to be integrated, and has been shown to be making the decision in a state of sound mind, then they are to be permitted to do so. Item Number SCP-189 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Samples of SCP-189 are to be stored in cryo-containment facility with any surplus destroyed by incineration. Test subjects infected with SCP-189 are to be kept in a sealed containment chamber with an airlock that includes a chemical shower. Personnel interacting with test subjects must wear standard NBC hazard suits throughout their time inside the containment chamber and submit to a chemical shower before exiting the airlock on their way out. When test subjects expire or are terminated, their remains must be sealed in an airtight container or body bag, which is subjected to the same chemical shower as the personnel carrying it out of the containment chamber and disposed of by incineration. Staff members found to be infested with SCP-189 are to be quarantined, according to the procedure outlined above for test subjects, and treated with antiparasitic agent 189A. 
If SCP-189 infestation is discovered on any individual or animal at a facility, all personnel and animals at that facility are to be inspected. For the presence of SCP-189 as detailed in Procedure 189-1. Any staff members treated as described above, any D-Class and or non-SCP animals terminated and incinerated, and the facility subjected to a thorough cleaning with antiparasitic agent 189-A. Should any cases of SCP-189 infestation be confirmed in persons or animals outside the Foundation, all those affected are to be immediately taken into custody and quarantined. Animals should be euthanized and incinerated while humans are to be treated with antiparasitic agent 189A for the infestation, then administered class C or B amnestics. Any individuals who may have been in close contact with the infectees and or enter their personal vehicle or place of residence should be checked for SCP-189 infestation and treated if necessary. Description: SCP-189 is a species of parasitic roundworm. Tentative taxonomic classification, data expunged, capable of infesting any mammalian life form. Infection most commonly occurs as a result of direct skin contact with one or more egg sacs. These egg sacs are covered with microscopic hooks, similar to those on the cuticles of some species of nematode, which anchor the sacs to the skin's surface. Contact with sebum then prompts the eggs inside to hatch, at which time, the larvae seek out and burrow into one or more nearby hair follicles. Once inside the follicle, the larva attaches itself at the base of the papilla and begins feeding off the capillaries supplying the papilla. Over the course of two to three days, the larva grows larger and develops into an adult. When it has fully matured, the new adult detaches from the papilla, severs the hair fiber from the root, and almost fully envelops the papilla and hair matrix. From this point forward, the worm feeds on the cells shed by the hair matrix, which would normally form the hair fiber, and begins to grow longer. Adult SCP-189 specimens grow only in length, extruding a tail, which incorporates some of the pigments and keratin from the cells they consume into an outer cuticle. This, combined with the fact that the diameter of a specimen's tail is usually similar to that of the hair that would normally grow from the host follicle causes SCP-189 to be visually indistinguishable from a normal hair, except upon microscopic inspection. However, some specimens will occasionally flex, coil and uncoil, and or lash their tail, particularly in response to tactile stimulation. The reason for this behavior is not currently understood, nor is why only some individuals behave in this fashion, though it has been proposed that data expunged. As with many other species of roundworms, SCP-189 is hermaphroditic, with both sets of genitalia contained in the head, the portion enveloping the papilla and hair matrix. Fertilized eggs are produced in groups of one to three and enveloped in a protective egg sac, which is then incorporated into the growing tail. Egg sacs grow their microscopic hooks, and the eggs typically mature by the time the portion of the tail containing them has extended approximately one millimeter beyond the surface of the host's skin. Once fully developed, the egg sac passes to the exterior of the organism's tail, becoming loosely embedded in its cuticle. At this point, if the egg sac is brought into contact with a suitable host surface, including the skin of the current host, it attaches to this surface and is pulled free from its parent. This is the primary method SCP-189 uses both to infect new hosts and to further infest the current host. The tail of an adult specimen of SCP-189 is no more durable than normal hair, and its head no more strongly attached to the host follicle. The tail can be cut or broken, or the entire organism pulled out, by any method that would similarly affect hair. Severed sections of an adult's tail can grow a new head and regenerate into a separate individual, but only if they can attach to a suitable host. The death of a follicle infested by an adult SCP-189, or any other event that would cause the loss of that follicle's hair, causes that individual to detach from its host. Without a host, adult SCP-189 die within one to six hours. Mature eggs can remain viable for up to several years after the death of their parent, and as such, even dead adults can present a risk of infestation. 
When an infected host dies, any surviving adult specimens of SCP-189 continue to feed and grow, eventually burrowing into the host's tissues. Once decay begins, however, the specimen is killed by the toxins produced. Addendum 1 SCP-189 was first discovered in 19 when Dr. A.F., then unaffiliated with the Foundation, traveled to a remote area of the data-expunged rainforest as part of a six-month biodiversity survey. Dr. F. brought Kara, his three-year-old pet golden retriever, along with him on the expedition. It seems likely that the dog was first infested sometime during this trip. Regardless of when the infestation began, by the time Dr. F. and Kara returned to the United States, it is believed that over 80% of the animal's follicles had been infested by SCP-189. Approximately days after his return, Dr. F. was petting Kara when the dog's fur began to move. Recognizing the abnormal nature of the infestation, Dr. F. contacted Dr. I.W., a parasitologist, with an invitation to study the newly discovered organism. It was when Drs. F. and W. submitted a paper on SCP-189 for publication that the Foundation became aware of its existence and immediately took Drs. F. and W. into custody and seized all of their research materials. Both doctors were later recruited into the Foundation, with Dr. W. becoming the lead researcher in charge of SCP-189 and currently stationed in Data Expunged, investigating indigenous populations of SCP-189 for possible containment or eradication. Addendum 2 Since the Foundation first became aware of SCP-189, there have been numerous incidents of infestation outside the Foundation, resulting in humans and animals confirmed infected in various parts of the world. Continued monitoring is warranted to ensure that such incidents do not come to the attention of the general public. Item Number SCP-021 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-021 is an obligate parasite of the human body. Containment, therefore, is no more difficult than containing an adult human. Most cells will suffice. Item is currently housed in Detention Cell 217A on Subject D-139. Only Class D personnel are eligible for hosting SCP-021. As long as a given subject survives as a host for SCP-021, he is exempt from normal monthly terminations of Class D personnel. Description: SCP-021 takes the form of a large and elaborate tattoo of a serpentine dragon in the Oriental style covering approximately 0.8 meters squared of skin. This tattoo is fully animate within the confines of its host's skin and behaves largely as a normal animal would, albeit in only two dimensions. The tattoo's movement causes constant pain to its host, comparable and similar in character to simultaneous tattooing and tattoo removal on a large scale. The organism tends to spend most of its time on and near the torso, SCP-021 displays no intelligence beyond a basic pattern of feeding and locomotion, although actually measuring the intelligence of a two-dimensional life form has proven impossible thus far. SCP-021 appears to feed exclusively on pigments in the host's skin. This can include melanin, in which case the subject appears to be suffering from vitiligo. However, the organism shows a marked preference for other tattoos and will seek out and devour these before resorting to natural pigments. It should be noted that the feeding process itself, beyond the sensation of movement, is painless. Normal tattooing simply vanishes as it is eaten. The organism maintains a constant size, and no excretions have been observed. The organism is capable of clearing over 0.6 meters squared of skin per hour. One may feed SCP-021 by quickly tattooing fruits or small animals on the host. SCP-021 can be transferred between hosts by various forms of physical contact, with differing rates of success. In the case of successful transfer, the organism simply swims from one person to the other. Sexual intercourse appears to be the most reliable method of transfer, with a 93% rate of transmission. However, due to the severe pain involved, this is less than ideal. Contact between two open wounds is generally preferable. Transfer is more complicated in deceased subjects, though not unreasonably so. 
The organism suffers no ill effects from the death of its host and continues to consume pigments. Transmission between species is unknown. Previous tests suggest it to be either impossible or exceedingly rare. SCP-021 does confer some benefits to its host. The tattoo has been proven to accelerate the release and reuptake of epinephrine and decrease lactic acid buildup, providing boosts of strength, confidence, and pain tolerance in stressful situations, and reducing the usual after-effects of weakness and fatigue. In addition, the tattoo seems to have some beneficial effect on the host's immune system. Aggression profiles in hosts are generally higher than average, though whether this is a direct effect of the tattoo or simply a reaction to the constant pain remains to be seen. The symbiotic relationship is usually limited by how long the host can tolerate such pain in everyday life. This has culminated in suicide in a number of subjects. In rare cases, hosts have also fallen victim to fatal skin infections. SCP-021's origins and nature are a mystery. Tracing its transmission from host to host is hardly feasible within the confines of secrecy, and the organism could well be hundreds of years old, if not more. Nevertheless, SCP-021's captivity is one of the longest in the Foundation's history, at nearly data-expunged years, and has been very educational thus far. Current research focuses mainly on observing the characteristics of life in two dimensions. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.